Good evening, friends, and a warm welcome to our midweek meeting for prayer and Bible study. Our Bible study this evening is our penultimate study in the Minor Prophets, uh, for we're looking tonight at the prophecy of Zechariah. And uh, Zechariah is uh, fairly easy um, to find. The final last book of the Old Testament is Malachi, and uh, Zechariah is the book that comes before Malachi. And that's going to be our study in a moment. But before we get there, let's just pause and call on the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And we thank you again that you have revealed yourself to us in Scripture. And we marvel at the word of God. So many different authors, so many different literary genre, uh, written over such a long period of time, yet guided and directed in every way by your Holy Spirit, so that what we turn to this evening is not the word of man, but the word of God. And so we pray now that your Spirit might be with us, and that you might give us understanding of this passage before us. For this we cry in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this evening we're looking at Zechariah. Zechariah has 14 chapters, and it's a very interesting book, and there is much here to consider. And the reality is, that we are not going to be able tonight to consider all the truths that are found in this great book. How then shall we approach it? Well, many years ago, I paid a visit to a very well-known football stadium in the north of England. Uh, I'm not going to tell you uh, what football stadium that was, because that will get you all excited. Some of you will be really delighted to know uh, that I was there, whilst others will <coughs> be agitated and uh, you might even turn off, you might be able to listen from uh, this moment forward uh, because you feel so uh, distressed that I would visit such a stadium, uh, a vast football stadium. And we were on a tour that was taken into the security room. Uh, you will recognize that on match days, thousands and thousands of people attend these football matches, and there is a need for a police presence, and there is a need to make sure that nothing untoward occurs within the crowd. I, I recollect that on that day, when we were in the security room, uh, we were shown a number of cameras, and these cameras were able to scan across the crowd fairly rapidly. So as the match was taking place, there were several folk based in the security room sitting at these cameras that were just panning around the stadium. And they of course would be able to pick up if there was any trouble, if there was any incident, any violence, any fighting, any of that nature taking place. They could pick that up fairly quickly with the, the big sweep camera. But there was also another camera. And this was a very interesting one. Because the stewards could radio through to the security room and they could say, can you check out the guy who's sitting in block E, row 17, seat 23. And wonderfully, this camera that they had in the security room would be able just to focus directly on the person sitting in that particular seat. And the police who were there uh, would, most of them, be, be fairly able to recognize whether this guy was a known criminal or at least someone who was known to be a little bit of a thug who turned up at football matches, not for the football, but for the fights. There were cameras that scanned the whole stadium and took in the whole picture. And then there were other cameras that could focus directly 
on a particular individual. And that's exactly the kind of approach that we're going to take to the prophecy of Zechariah this evening. We're going to scan the whole book. We're going to, very quickly, just seek to obtain an overview of what's going on here in this prophecy. Then, having done that, we are going to focus on one particular chapter, chapter 3. Uh, we're going to take a close look at one of the chapters, because I think that that will give us a feel of what the whole book is like and will enable us to understand something of what's happening in these pages. A general scan and a particular focus. As we come to general scan, there are five things that we should notice here. The first is that Zachariah is the prophet who is responsible for this book that is before us. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Edo. Zechariah is the author of this book. Now, it happens to be a book in two parts. Uh, those of you who are very familiar with Zechariah and have spent some time studying it will find that a very simplistic statement. But I stand over it. In terms of a general scan, this is a book in two parts. Chapters 1 to 8 and chapters 9 to 14. 1 to 8 and 9 to 14. Now there's a lot of debate uh, among biblical scholars as to whether Zachariah wrote the whole book. Uh, there are many who suggest that someone else wrote chapters 9 to 14. If you're interested in questions of authorship and uh, you have had some concerns about this matter of whether Zechariah wrote the whole book or only part of the book, I would direct you to E.J. Young's introduction to the Old Testament. Well, it's a little dated. Now what he has to say here concerning Zechariah as author of the whole book is very useful and worthwhile. E.J. Young's introduction to the Old Testament. It's a book in two parts, written by Zechariah. Then the second thing I want you to notice uh, as we come to the, the overview of Zechariah is this. Remember what a prophet is and what a prophet is doing. He is a fourth teller and he is a foreteller. He's a fourth teller and he's a foreteller. Chapters 1 to 8 are a series of eight dreams. Eight dreams during which Zachariah is seeking to encourage the people of God. He is forth telling, as it were. He's bringing the word of the Lord to them. He's encouraging them. Chapters 9 to 14, well, essentially, there the prophet is foretelling. He's looking forward. He's looking forward ultimately to the coming of the Messiah, to the birth of Jesus, to uh, Jesus establishing his kingdom. He's looking forward indeed. Uh, many would argue, and I would be among them, to the return of Christ in power and glory. Zechariah wrote a book that's in two parts. He's forth-telling and he's foretelling. Then the third thing to notice is that Zechariah is operating here at the same time as Haggai. Now Haggai was prophesying just for a period of months. Zechariah is prophesying for a much longer period of time. But the historical context is the same. People of God have been taken into exile by the Babylonians. The Babylonian Empire has collapsed. Persia is now the big dominant world superpower. The Persian rulers have given permission to the people of God to return to Judah and Jerusalem. A number of them have done that. 
Zerubbabel is the political leader. Joshua is the spiritual leader. Ezra and Nehemiah are the books that give us the historical record of this, the return of the people of God from exile. They return with great enthusiasm. They begin to rebuild the temple. They get the foundations in place. They establish an altar and then they pack it in. They pack it in for years and years. But God sends Haggai and Zechariah into this situation where there's lethargy where the people of God have stopped working. The exiles have returned, but they are not progressing with the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple as they ought to be. And into that context, God sends Haggai and Zechariah to stir them up, to prod them into action. So it's a big book, a book of 14 chapters written by Zechariah. He's encouraging the people of God. He's also looking forward to things that will happen in the future. But his ministry takes place at the same time as Haggai and has the same purpose to prod God's people who are lethargic and materialistic into action. It's a book also, maybe more so than any of the minor prophets, it is full of Jesus. And there are very distinct and clear messianic strands in the book of Zechariah, especially in the chapters 9 to 14, uh, where the prophet is looking forward um, to the coming of Jesus, to the death of Jesus. Allow me just to quote three verses, Zechariah 9 and verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Well, you know those words, don't you? Uh, here's a prophecy that was fulfilled on the first Ham Sunday as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Or again, in chapter 12, and at verse 10, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. They will look on me, on him whom they have pierced. An obvious reference to the death of Jesus. And then a, a, a reference in chapter 14 to the return of Christ. Chapter 14, verse 4. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies below Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. Now we're going to discuss and debate that verse. And for some time uh, this evening, but let's just, just notice it as a messianic reference here to the return of Jesus. It's full of Jesus, this prophecy. But the final thing I want to say to you is this, it's an apocalyptic book, and it's apocalyptic language. Like the second half of Daniel, like Ezekiel, like the book of the Revelation, this is apocalyptic literature and you must bear that in mind. Now for myself I find it hard to cope with apocalyptic literature. I find it hard to understand and to enter into. It's a literary genre with which I'm not particularly familiar or skilled in interpreting. It's vivid picture language. Take a look at some of these pictures. Just quick, come with me. Chapter 5, verse 1. Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a flying scroll. So in his vision, in his dream, he sees a flying scroll. Chapter 6, verse 1. Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, and the fourth dappled horses, all of them strong. See, 
Vivid graphic picture language. Can I make a wee suggestion to you? If you were to walk a few hundred yards down the road here to the Ulster Museum, go to the top floor to the art gallery, you would see many paintings there. Now, I am not an artist, nor an art critic, but can I give you a piece of advice? Don't stand too close to the picture. If you stand right in like this, right in the picture, you'll not really appreciate it or understand it. You need to stand back a little from the picture and see the whole scene. And when we come to a book like Zachariah, to apocalyptic literature, it's important that we don't stand in too close to the picture. Stand back, stand back. There'll be things in the picture that you will not understand. There'll be things in the picture that you and your friend will disagree over. So make sure you stand back and get the big picture. Here then is the camera that scans. The whole way around the stadium, we have scanned Zachariah. Now we're going to that other camera, the one that moves in close, the one that can pick up someone in a particular seat and take a close look at them. And we're going to do that by going to chapter 3 here. Zechariah chapter 3, God's Word. Let's read it together from the beginning. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Here now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. Amen. Now, some of you already have just moved in too close to the picture. You've got in too close. Some of you already are staring not at the big picture here, not at the big picture, but you are steering excuse me a moment we've had a little a little bit of movement there and uh, I think we're back on board we're back on board I got myself very excited there you see uh, about the big picture and coming in uh, close and I think some of you have come in uh, too close uh, take the big picture you see don't get absorbed with the seven eyes in verse 9. Don't get absorbed with the inscription of verse 9. Don't get absorbed with what this turban is in verse 5. What's this all about here? 
It's about Joshua. Joshua is the high priest. He is the spiritual representative of the people, if you like. He is the one who is coming before God on behalf of the people and he is offering sacrifices unto God on behalf of the people. And he is standing here in verse 1, in this vision, in the presence of God. Joshua, the priest, standing in the presence of God. And Satan is accusing him. Now, we could get diverted into what was Satan doing there. Is this a, a situation like we read about in the book of Job? We could get diverted get into that. But we don't want to get diverted into that uh, this evening. Satan is there. Joshua is in the presence of God. And Satan is accusing Joshua. What is he saying? Well, he's saying this. He's saying, oh, look at you, Joshua. What right do you have to be a priest? What right have you to stand in the presence of God? You're a sinful man. You're leading a people who are lethargic, materialistic, and disobedient. Both individually, as Joshua, you don't have a right to be here in the presence of God. And, in terms of the people you represent, look at them. Disobedient. Sinful. Who do you think you are? Coming before God. And notice what happens. Joshua has nothing to say. He has nothing to say. He's got nothing to say because he knows that these allegations are in so many respects correct. But the Lord stands up for Joshua. The Lord takes Satan on in verse 2. The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? What is the Lord saying here? I have chosen Jerusalem. I have chosen these people who reside in Judah. I have chosen Joshua. He's like a brand plucked from the fire. The fire is a reference to the exile. The fire is a reference to the Babylonian captivity. And I have set him and my people free from captivity. I've taken them out of the fire. They're my people. And you're accusing him. And you're accusing my people through him. But I want to tell you, Satan, that I stand by my people. And then wonderfully, things develop. What right have we, what right have you to come into the presence of God? Who are you to be coming before God? Look at your heart. Look at your sin. Look at your inconsistencies. Look at your failures. Look at your unbelief. Look at your disobedience. What right have you to come into the presence of God? What right have I to come into the presence of God? Sometimes Satan comes and he whispers in his ear, our ears, and, and he says, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are coming into the presence of God? God stands by his people and God forgives his people. We have no right to come into the presence of God. We have no right to stand before the Lord in and of ourselves. We can't plead before God who we are or what we've done. All we can do is cast ourselves on the grace and mercy and forgiveness of God. And here the Lord stands by Joshua. He defends his servant and he shows Satan that Joshua is a man who's forgiven, whose sin is cleansed and pardoned. We're told that he was standing before the Lord with filthy garments, verse 3. But what happens? The filthy garments are taken off him, verse 4, and he's given clean clothes. He's also given a clean turban to put upon his head. So the old clothes are done away with. And new clothes are given to Joshua. The old clothes represent sin, disobedience. The new clothes represent cleansing and forgiveness. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Satan accusing us. 
Who do you think you are coming before God? Just look at your life. Look at your sin. Look at those bad sins you've engaged in. Who do you think you are? And the Lord says, leave him alone. Leave him alone. I've chosen him. I've chosen him. He's one of my people. But more than that, I have forgiven him. I have cleansed him. I have pardoned him. I have saved him from sin. Then in verses 6 and 7, the Lord gives instruction to Joshua as to how he is to conduct himself if he is to be a faithful priest of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Up until now, it's about Joshua, about Joshua being accused, Joshua being defended by the Lord, Joshua as one who's cleansed, pardoned, forgiven, and saved from sin. It's a picture of God choosing his people, defending his people, and forgiving his people. And it's very reassuring and comforting for us this evening. The accuser is never, never off our heels, always after us, always condemning us. But our God is with us. He chose us. He saved us. He stands by us. He defends us. He's the one who's taken off our filthy garments and given to us a new robe, the robe of Christ's righteousness. Well, things change. Things change. Up until verse 7, it's about Joshua. But from verse 8 to 10, it's about one greater than Joshua. It's not about Joshua the high priest, but it's about Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Joshua is a type of Jesus. He is a type of the great priest who is to come, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I know that? Well, verse 8. Behold, I will bring my servant, the branch, for behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its description, declares the Lord of hosts. So there's someone being spoken about here who's described as being a servant, a branch, and a stone. Remember Isaiah, he's got servant songs, the end of chapter 52 and right in to chapter 53. A servant, the servant of the Lord. He's been alluded to here. Who is that? None other than the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Who is the branch? Well, Isaiah, again, in chapter 11 of his prophecy, speaks about one who will come. The branch. It's a messianic term. It points forward to Jesus. And what about this stone? Well, there are aspects of the stone here that are mysterious and that are hard for us to understand. But in Psalm 118, we read about a stone, a stone whom the builders rejected, a reference to Jesus. So Joshua, I chose you, I called you, I set you apart to be a priest. Satan accuses you, but I stand by you and by all my people. I've forgiven you, I've cleansed you, I've pardoned you, I've taken off the filthy garments and I've given you new, pure clothes. Serve me well. And you, you are a picture, you are a type of the one who is to come, the great high priest, the Messiah, the servant, the branch, the stone, none other than Jesus himself. And what will he do? He will, verse 9, remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. That's the cross, isn't it? That's a reference to Jesus going to the cross in our place, bearing our sin, dying for us. He will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. What foresight Zachariah was given. Not only to encourage the people to start rebuilding. Not only to stir the people up that they might get to work but enabled by the Lord and his spirit to look forward to a time when Jesus, the Messiah, would come. A time 
when he would die on a cross, a Calvary, on a single day, deal with the sins of his people. At the time, if you read on into chapter 14, when he who died on the cross and descended into heaven would return in power and glory to establish the new heavens and the new earth. Here is Zachariah then, the fourth teller and the four teller. May we be helped by this book that he has given to us and particularly by this vision that we have in chapter 3 and if Satan is accusing you tonight bothering you and saying who do you think you are to come into the presence of God God has chosen you God will stand by you God has forgiven you God has cleansed you God has saved you